The rapture of the church is, as I mentioned last week, somewhat of a controversial issue inasmuch as there are a number of opinions on mainly uh, the timing of this particular event. There are actually some uh, people who do not even believe in the event itself, but there's such a small number that we don't need to uh, give too much consideration to that. But our purpose tonight is to look at what the Bible has to say about the rapture, what it is, and when it will occur in relation to other important events. And so that will be uh, basically what we will be covering this evening. World War II's basic statistics qualify it as by far the greatest war in history in terms of human resources expended. In all, 61 countries with over 1.7 billion people, three-fourths of the world's population took part in that war. 60 million people lost their lives in World War II. Based on the present population of the world and the numbers given in the book of Revelation, somewhere above five billion people will die in the tribulation period. The tribulation will be a time of unprecedented death and destruction. As Jesus himself said, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. For any thinking person, the prospect of having to endure such a time of death and destruction is terrifying, to say the least. But the good news is this. The good news is that the church will not go through the tribulation. For Paul the Apostle told us that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The event that we call the rapture is the means by which God will save or deliver his people from wrath. And so the first question that we need to address is, what is the rapture? Well, to put it simply, the rapture is an unprecedented event in history where every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is miraculously and instantly taken to heaven without experiencing death. Let me state that once again. The rapture is an unprecedented event in history where every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is miraculously and instantly taken to heaven without experiencing death. The rapture is, in a sense, part one of the second coming. The rapture is, in a sense, part one of the second coming. At the second coming, Christ will return to the earth with his people to set up his kingdom. And of course, the Bible has much to say about the second coming of Christ. At the rapture, Christ will come not to the earth, but he will come into the earth's atmosphere and he will call his people up to be with him. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that there are going to be actually two aspects to the second coming. I know for some that might be a little shocking and some would even maybe initially think, uh-oh, heresy. But we shouldn't be surprised at that. For this reason, there were two aspects to the first coming. There were two aspects to the first coming. 
Jesus came first to Bethlehem as foretold by Micah. He came then to Jerusalem some 30 years or so later as foretold by Daniel and Zechariah. See, there was a period of time between the first aspect of his first coming, born as a babe in Bethlehem, and the second aspect of his first coming, being presented to Jerusalem as the king of Israel. Both events were prophesied separately, and there was a period of time between the two. So likewise, there will be at least a seven-year period of time between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. Now, this term, the rapture, is one that we need to consider for just a moment because the word rapture is not found in uh, any of our English translations. And the reason for that is because the English translations that we have were, of course, translated from the Greek. But Jerome, when he was putting together what is known as the Latin Vulgate, Jerome translated from Greek into Latin, and the word that he used to translate the Greek word harpazo, which is the word that we base the whole term rapture on, the word harpazo means to be caught up or to be uh, delivered out of, to be snatched away. Uh, when Jerome was translating the Greek word harpazo into Latin, he translated it rapturo. And so the rapture comes from really the Latin translation of the Greek word harpazo. Sometimes people uh, contend against the idea of the rapture by stating that the Bible doesn't mention it. The Bible doesn't use the term. Well, it depends on whether you're using the Greek or the Latin translation, I guess. It does mention it if you're using the Latin translation. But just because it doesn't use the particular word doesn't mean that the event isn't a reality. After all, the Bible does not use the word trinity. But yet we know that God is a triunity. We know that there is one God who exists in three persons. We know the doctrine of the Trinity, not because the Bible uses the word Trinity specifically, but because all of teaching, put all of uh, Scripture put together teaches us that there is one God and three persons. So just because we don't have the word rapture does not uh, negate the concept. Now, the two most descriptive text on the rapture are found in Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians and then in Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. And I'd like to read both of those passages to you, beginning, first of all, in the first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 51 through 55. First Corinthians, chapter 15, Verses 51 through 55. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? So here Paul tells us. He tells us a mystery. A mystery in the New Testament, the word mysterion, the Greek word, means something that cannot be known apart from revelation. It's different than the meaning of our modern word mystery. When we think of the word mystery in uh, contemporary terms, we think of something mysterious, something that can't be known. But the New Testament doesn't use the word in that way. It means something that can't be known apart from revelation. So this was something that was previously unknown, but has now been revealed. And Paul is bringing this message to us, the mystery is that we shall not all sleep. This is Paul's way of referring to death. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, the next passage that we want to look at is 1 Thessalonians 
chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the